having me here and letting me speak to you today. I've been having the best time ever. Um, it's just very exciting to be in the presence of these minds and to be learning from all of you. I, I really can't thank you enough. I just saw last night my, my first wild orcas ever and I've been working on that. On issues to do with cetaceans in Canada for several years and I've only seen orcas in captivity so that was very special. Um, I thought I'd start off by telling you a bit about myself, who I am, and why I'm here, mainly because if I discuss Canadian legislation and regulation for an entire half an hour I, I think you'll all be sound asleep. <laughs> but also because in light of the theme of scholarly advocacy I think I'm actually an interesting example as I'm someone with a very different scholarly background and now I'm using my particular skill set to advocate for what I'm passionate about which is animal rights and more specifically getting the necessary protections in place to help cetaceans both internationally and domestically. So a bit about me and how I came to be working on these issues. So I, I do work for an animal charity in Canada called ZooCheck. It, it was founded and it's based in Toronto, so nowhere near the oceans. It's an interesting place to be working on cetacean issues. My formal education is actually in English literature. I have a PhD in African American modern fiction, nothing related to marine mammals whatsoever. But since childhood, my passion has been animals, and in particular, dolphins. And this will really date me, and it's totally embarrassing, but I'm going to admit it to you. As a child, I saw an album cover of Olivia Newton-John swimming with dolphins. I don't know if any of you remember that. And wow, I just thought, I have to do that one day. That's my absolute dream. So I kept going to school, studying English. And then in my 20s, I decided to take a trip alone to Nassau in the Bahamas to swim with dolphins. It was completely exhilarating for me. It was truly life cha changing. I profoundly regretted that I hadn't gone into marine biology or some such field. And from that point on, I continued studying English, <laughs> but decided that in my spare time when I had the money, I was going to start trying to do internships with Atlantic bottlenose dolphins in the Bahamas. The facility I started going to is actually advertised as semi captivity because um, a couple of the dolphins, the reality is there's only about two dolphins at the facility that are allowed in and out of the actual enclosure to do swim with dolphins programs in the open ocean. Um, and they do that not even on a daily basis. So I, I did several stints there working with the dolphins and I loved interacting with the dolphins. I became very close and to this day I have a lot of very good friends who are animal trainers, so the, the dolphin trainers there. Um, and I became friends with a marine biologist who later asked me to join him on Salt Spring Island and do some seal pup rescue work, which was actually very short-lived for me because I quickly decided I was not okay ethically with what was going on. And from those experiences combined with a visit that came up here to the dolphin habitat at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas, a place that left me utterly flabbergasted at how there was a group of dolphins swimming in barren tanks in the middle of the desert and what it must have put them through just to get them there. Something in my brain, like a switch just basically flipped in my brain and I came to the realization that cetaceans do not belong in captivity. This was probably a couple of years before blackfish. Um, so I wanted to do something so I started going to Marineland Canada protests and we just talked a little bit about, about Marine Land, but basically Marine Land is a privately owned entertainment park, theme park with rides and roller coasters that holds marine mammals and a lot of other animals in absolutely deplorable conditions. It's located in the province of Ontario. It's nowhere near the ocean. I'm from Ontario. And it has Canada's only orca in captivity. Her name is Kiska. She's actually the same age as me. And she was originally captured in Iceland and, and brought for public display. Marineland also has the largest private collection, I believe, of belugas in the world, and it has many dolphins. And I grew up being taken there by very well-meaning parents and grandparents who were avid animal lovers, but who, as I like to phrase it, drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. <laughs> so they never had it pointed out to them to consider captivity from the animal's point of view. And I find that really amazing. As soon as you talk to people about 
these issues, how quickly it's like, oh, oh, I never thought of that, and how quickly you realize, what am I actually teaching my children if I take them to one of these facilities? So yeah, so I started going to protest there, and that was something very obvious to me that I could do as a way to take action and get involved. Um, and protests of Marine Land Canada have been going on forever, so the majority of Canadians really do want that place to be shut down. In fact, last year at ZooCheck, we had countrywide polls done by one of the most reputable polling companies in all of Canada, Ipsos Reid, asking people of all ages, walks of life, and with varying levels of education about how they feel about cetaceans in captivity. I'll just give you a couple of examples. 81% of Canadians believe there are effective educational alternatives to the captive display of marine mammals, such as orcas, dolphins, and the sea. And 73% of Canadians, uh, according to our polls, believe that Canada should ban the importation of wild-caught marine mammals, such as orcas, dolphins, and belugas, captured in foreign waters. So, from going to the protests, I met all kinds of people, and I got invited at a certain point to a screening of Blackfish. And it was actually attended by Samantha Berg and by Dr. Naomi Rose, who spoke on the issue. And that's where I decided I wanted to do more, and, and I wanted to just basically find out how to get a ban in place so that we no longer have these mammals on captive display because I could see the protests just go on and on, and there's absolutely, I believe in protesting, I still attend the protests there whenever I can, but more needed to be done in a legislative way. It still does, unfortunately, it's a current fight. So I started writing letters to MPs, to federal ministers, and contacting animal rights advocacy groups. That was a few years ago now, I think, and, and since then, I've been working in policy, I just want to stress that most people in policy don't actually have a formal policy or political science background. So if you want to bring about real change, often, unfortunately, what you have to do is, you know, bring about legislative change. Um, and you can absolutely do it. It really is not rocket science. It's kind of the grunt work, but it's really necessary and crucial to change. So bear with me now as I get into the nitty gritty of this uh, dry policy, but I'll try to explain it to you. So in Canada, we have very strict regulations that prevent capture in our own waters. However, capture and importation of whales and dolphins is still very much possible from international waters. Primarily, it's done in Iceland and Russian waters, I believe, Icelandic and Russian waters, and often the animals are taken from the Black Sea. What needs to be done is we basically need to close this wild capture loophole. A few of us in Canada are working on this through different approaches simultaneously. Right now, um, there's a Nova Scotia senator named Wilfred Moore, and he's introduced a bill, Bill S203, and it's a private member's bill where basically the object of it is to ban the acquisition of and the breeding of cetaceans in Canada. The purpose is to phase out captivity of these species. There's also another bill, a private member's bill, which is currently in its second reading, introduced by a federal MP, so that's going through the House of Commons. Um, and it's, it's not directly related, it's actually a bill to amend the criminal code for stricter penalties to do with animal cruelty. And it would prohibit the importation of shark fins not attached to the rest of the shark carcass. This bill is not directly relevant to this effort, but it's a good step in the right direction. And then there's what I'm doing with Rob Laidlaw at ZooCheck. Um, it's to, to close the, the wild capture loophole. It's kind of the easiest, most pragmatic kind of backdoor approach. Um, and what that is, is basically to persuade our federal minister of the environment, her name is Catherine McKenna, we have a new liberal government in Canada, so we were thinking, yay, we were thinking. <laughs> but apparently anything to do with animal issues, they don't want to grant you a meeting, it's, it's very disheartening, but we're, we're working on it. But anyway, um, Catherine McKenna is our federal minister of the environment, and honestly, she has the ability, with the stroke of her pen, to just make a tiny amendment to a current regulation, which I will explain to you now, if we can get a meeting with her. But apparently, three years on the same issue is not enough time <laughs> with all the research 
for them to, to yeah, think we know what we're talking about to meet with us. So Canada is a signatory to CITES. CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Many countries are signatories to CITES, including the United States. CITES works, and this is a quote from CITES, by subjecting international trade in specimens of selected species to certain controls. All import, export, re-export, and introduction from the sea of species covered by the convention has to be authorized through a licensing system. Each party to the convention must designate one or more management authorities in charge of administering that licensing system and one or more scientific authorities to advise them on the effects of trade on the status of the species. So the species covered by CITES are listed in three appendices according to the degree of protection they need. Appendix one pertains to species threatened with extinction. And actually, there are many citations on Appendix 1. Um, I have, I've brought a copy of CITES, and it's also available online if anyone wants to see. Appendix 2 is what we're working on, because it's um, bottlenose dolphins, orcas, and belugas fall under Appendix 2. Um, and this pertains to species not necessarily threatened with extinction, but in which trade must be controlled to avoid use incompatible with their survival. And Appendix 3 pertains to species that are protected in at least one country, which has asked other CITES parties for assistance in controlling the trade. So, bear with me, almost through it. For Appendix 1, pertaining to species threatened with extinction, an import and export permit are needed. So there's very strict uh, licensing going on here with that. For Appendix 2, which is what we're concerned with, the one bottlenose dolphins, orcas, and belugas fall under, only an export permit from the country of origin is required. In other words, if you want to import one of these animals into Canada, you don't even need to apply for any kind of permit. There's no need for public comment. I, I don't know the, the rules in the US as well, but I'm pretty sure um, it's quite a bit stricter when it comes to that. Um, so we are requesting more stringent regulations here for the animals listed on Appendix 2, asking for an amendment which would also require an import permit, which would include the chance for public comment on any proposal by a business, a zoo, or an individual applying for such an import permit, which would likely stop the process in its tracks. So ideally, we're requesting a total ban on the import of dolphins, orcas, and belugas, but even achieving the import permit would likely result in the same thing. Practically speaking, the real problem for many years has been the capture and importation of belugas by John Holler, the owner of Marineland. Yeah. As I said, we only have one orca, and um, yeah, so it's really practically more realistically about belugas at this point. So the way to get this change is actually through another piece of legis legislation called WAPRIDA. WAPRIDA is the Wild Animal and Plant Protection and Regulation of International and Interprovincial Trade Act. This piece of legislation is specifically Canadian and it provides the legal mechanism for a regulation banning trade in wild caught cetaceans, as WAPRIDA is meant to implement Canada's CITES obligation. Canada has the ability to go beyond minimum CITES requirements, as all countries do, by enacting tougher domestic measures than envisioned by CITES. Other countries actually have done this, such as the European Union. Right now, Catherine McKenna, the current minister, I just got a letter last week, will not meet with us. We're trying one last ditch effort to meet with her chief of staff and or her senior policy advisor. And if that fails, we'll meet with the NDP critic for the environment. Um, basically, this is an easy win for the current government. It's something the minister has the power to do with the stroke of her pen, as I said. It's something the country supports. It's really only affecting a handful of animals. And we are confident with persistence. I'm still confident. I'm an optimist at heart. It will eventually get done before I'm gray, I hope. 
So while we aren't there yet on closing the wildcat review poll, I just wanted to leave with something a little less dire. We have had some recent wins in Canada regarding cetaceans in captivity. So some of you might know about last year, um, something called Bill 80 was passed in Ontario. I believe it got quite a bit of media attention. And it basically made it illegal to own or breed an orca in the province of Ontario. But there was a stipulation that if you already owned an orca in Ontario, you were allowed to keep your orca, which is why Kiska is still stuck at Marineland. So it was actually a symbolic win, but it got a lot of media coverage and it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Lastly, I just wanted to mention also the Vancouver Park Board implemented a no-breeding ban. Um, it's now been reversed, unfortunately, again. But again, it's attention to the issue and indicative of steps in the right direction. So I just want to leave off by saying if you want to get involved to bring about this change, you can be American, you can be you know, from any country in the world, and you can write to our minister, Catherine McKenna. I can give the address. Um, and just basically specify you want a ban on the breeding of current animals as well as a ban on the capture and import of more animals into Canada. And I'm done. You're awake. Thanks. I'll do my best to answer questions. Yes. Will you give us her email Yeah, for sure. I wonder, maybe I can put, is there a way to put it up on the Superpod website or maybe I can... Just uh, the address of our Minister of the Environment to write a letter. We definitely put it up on Voice of the Orcas website for sure, and we can feed it out. I'm a little hesitant in a way. It's almost better to, um, if I just give the address and people write privately, because our one worry is calling attend too much attention to the issue because we're trying to kind of go through backdoor channels without alerting um, like the Canadian Association of Zoos and Aquariums and people that are going to be very much opposed to this. So this is why we haven't put anything up on the Zoo Check website. Um, but let me let me think about that and I will find a way. <laughs> yeah, I, I can. Or you can if you Google Catherine McKenna. Um, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, -E. and her last name is M-C-K-E-N-N-A. She is our minister, federal minister of the environment, and you can look her address up online, but I can also uh, just read out, you would just put the Honorable Catherine McKenna, Minister of the Environment, House of Commons, Ottawa, Ontario, and with our postal code, not a zip code, K1A0A6. And anyone can come up to me and I'll give it to you again. I'm sorry, I didn't have a PowerPoint. It looks like yeah. it's Catherine with a C. Yes. Yeah. Did I say K? Because my name's a K. Thank you. <laughs> yes? What is, uh, in the United States, we're always writing, tweeting, then signing different petitions to mm -hmm. our officials. So it sounds like in Canada, it doesn't really have the same kind of influence or you don't really want to do that because it, it makes them less likely to, to answer? I mean, in general, I would say it's a great thing and that's like the number one way to be politically active for any individual. So I would definitely encourage everybody to reach out in Canada to their, not just their local MP, but their federal minister that they're trying to reach. Just because with this issue, this is a particular approach that we're trying right now because the other, the bills that are put forward just don't seem to, they fall flat, they don't get passed. Yes, sorry. Um, I don't know if this is something that would be useful at all, I'm not sure what the process of what you're trying to do is, but have you thought at all about trying to get in touch with Elizabeth May? Yes, because, and I will be shortly actually. Unfortunately, with this recent letter, so Elizabeth May, the, the NDP, the leader of the NDP, the opposition. Oh, what's that? Right. Oh, she's green. Sorry. Thank you. We will be getting in touch with her and, and the NDP critic of the environment. Um, but I'm going to wait to hear back first from the senior policy advisor and see if we should be, we should be able to get a meeting with the policy advisor if they don't want to grant it. So, yeah, good idea. Yes. Yeah, I just had a question because no government has ever had as many public consultations as the Trudeau government. And 
every MP has to do them, right? Like they have to go talk to their general public mm -hmm. about whatever that Trudeau says they have to. And I don't know if you've tried that route because it does seem to be a way to directly access them and they show up and they have to listen. That's a great idea. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea, and I've had that idea myself and haven't done it yet, but I think copies of the film, because really you just need to get the right person on side who takes a personal interest in the issue, and so much can happen. So I think sending her a copy of Blackfish is a, is a great idea, and to her senior staffers. So I will definitely take that. You guys are great. Where were you when I was just working on this in my office? <laughs> Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I does any I don't know much about that issue actually. What's the question? What's the question? The question is the Marine Land Belugas. Oh, the marine land belugas, no. Well, actually, many of them have been born in captivity. I think something like 31 or something were actually born at marine land. They breed like crazy. They're all together in one small space, but Iceland, yeah. Oh, no, Russia, Russia the Black Sea, right? right. Not, not only knows, just... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, none of the belugas are from Iceland. No Sorry, I meant the Black Sea, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Twenty-eight to Canada for Russia over time, mm -hmm. um, and there have been many birds, as Catherine just said, because they're they're induced ovulators. I can explain that to you later, but <laughs> man, they're just ovulating like crazy because there's so many of them in a small space, so they they can see. And he, he's had dozens of birds there. It's a, it's a breeding mill, puppy mill for belugas. Okay, and so there are. They're in two separate tank areas. There's two that are performing, and all the rest are in two separate yeah. enclosures in different configurations. All the females with their calves, and then everybody else. Any other questions? Well, thank you.